sacred place on earth is the, the place, the birth, the, the burial place of the Prophet where his body is touching, the, the soil around his body is more sacred than the Kaaba, the Arsh and the Kursi. There's nothing in the universe more sacred than the dust that touches the blessed body of the Prophet So today, inshallah, we'll cover in detail, uh, Imam Nizal, inshallah, will cover in detail the, where the Prophet is buried, how it looks, the times over history when people had access to it, and how it's been built up over time. So when you go to Umrah and, uh, and Hajj, and you look through those golden gates, and we try and see where the Prophet ﷺ is, obviously his companion, Sayyidina Abu Sadiq, Sayyidina Umar, all of this will be covered in detail, inshallah. The presentation will show you visually how it looks. And so when you go there, inshallah, when we have the tawfiq to go there, we'll understand exactly what we're looking at and how it's you know, behind the screen, what it actually looks like, inshallah. So please, inshallah, pay attention. We'll have this recorded anyway, inshallah. At the later stage, we'll have it up on, on, online on our website, inshallah, on our YouTube channel. So for now, please, jazakallah okay. khair. If we start with the salawat, his voice. We just inshallah start with a short salawat. Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تولوا فقل حسبي الله لا فقل حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم صدق الله العظيم of Shar of Qasida Budashi, please recite with me. Mawla ya salli wa sallim daiman abadan ala habibika khayril khalki kullihimi Mawla ya salli wa sallim daiman abadan ala habibika بك خير الخلق كلهم محمد سيد الكونين وثقلين محمد سيد الكونين وثقلين والفريق قين من عرب ومن عجم مولا يا صل لي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبي بك خير الخلق كلهم هو الحبي بالذي ترجى شفاعته هو الحبي 
بلذی ترجا شافا آتوہ لی کلی ہو لمین الاحوال مکتاحی می مولا یا صلی و سلم دائما آبادا على حبیبیکا خیر الخلق کلیہیم یا ربی بالمصطفی بلغ ما قاسدنا یا ربی بالمصطفی بلغ ما قاسدنا واغفر لنا ما مضا یا واسع الكرام مولا یا صلی و سلم دائما آبادا على حبیبیکا خیر الخلق کلیہیم الحمد لله الحمد لله الملك القدوس السلام الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد والصلاة والسلام على من كان نبيا وآدم بين الماء والطين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته وأهل بيته وعلماء ملته وشهداء محبته أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين صدق الله مولانا العلي العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم رب أنزلني منزلا مباركا وأنت خير المنزلين My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for giving us the tawfiq and the opportunity to have gathered here to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Rasul sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And alhamdulillah, through the nasiha uh, sessions that has been taking place every Wednesdays, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us here for attending. We, have, we are learning our deen, our religion to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's a Rasul sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. 
And inshallah, today's topic is going to be the history of the Qabr of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm not going to speak about the history of Medina Sharif, the Masjid itself, but this is specifically regarding the Qabr of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And adding on to that will be other things those people who are who came after the time of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the work that they have done to preserve the maqam, the blessed maqam and the blessed grave of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, this is going to be the first part because it is not possible to finish all of them in one day, in one sitting. I would like to keep it brief and short so that we can remember things and inshallah next week i will finish it off inshallah so today it is regarding sayyidina rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's maqam we've seen on television live perhaps many of us have been to medina munawwara we visited the grave of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, we are not able to see the actual grave of Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's barriers around the qabr of Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and there are reasons for it, inshallah, we will cover that as well, inshallah, as we go along. In the 11th Hijrah, Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he left this dunya. When he left this dunya, his family members, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyida Fatima, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umar Farooq, and many others, they were gathered around the body of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they decided to give him his ghusl. It is... Uh, a tradition that wherever a Nabi has passed away, you have to bury him in that place. So wherever Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he passed away in his Hujra Mubarak, in his room in which he lived with Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha. So where the bed is, the qabr of Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was prepared underneath that bed. Now there was an ikhtilaf amongst the Sahaba as to which type of qabr should Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should be buried in. Now, interestingly, that in Islam, we mainly have two types of qabr. We have two types of qabr. One which is preferred by the people of Mecca and one is preferred by the people of Medina. Both are valid, both are from Sayyidina Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a car, Blue Golf, MK16, WTE. MK16, WTE. Uh, it's blocking in front of, of, of uh, the masjid there, I think. So if it belongs to anybody of you here, please, Mehrbani, uh, try and remove it. So in Islam, we have two types of qabr. One is called a shaq And the second one is called a lahad The shaq one is the one that is used by the people of Makkah Mukarramah. And the second one, it is called a lahad And this is used by the people of Medina. Both of them are allowed in Islam. So there was an ikhtilaf amongst the Sahaba to which type of qabr should Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be buried in? It is not like today when there's an ikhtilaf, we are going to fight over it. Oh, I prefer this one or the other one would prefer the other one. But the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, with their ikhtilaf, there was rahmat between, between them. So the Sahaba, they said, look, both of them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used a shaq in Makkah Mukarrama, and in Medina Munawwara, he also used Al-Lahad. Now what is Shaq and what is Lahad? The Shaq one is the one that we usually use. There's a 
normal hole that is dug six, seven feet, depending on where you live. In some countries, they go to 11 feet, depending on weather condition. Water comes from the cover and things like that. In some places, seven, in some places, six. So it depends on the country that you're in. So it is a normal cover that we usually see. And the second type of cover, which is a lahad, it is in the form of an L shape. So a normal cover is dug. And inside the cover, there is a niche. There is like a small drawer that is dug and the body is, is put inside. You slide the body inside this niche or this drawer type. So this is called a lahad. And to be able to understand it a bit better, the picture that I have here, this is the normal one that we use, a shak. Some of them are large, some of them are, 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 are small, but it gives us the same indication of the same type of cover that we use in this country. And the second one, this is the lahad, a normal qabr is dug. And then in here, sometimes it is a bit larger. Unfortunately, I couldn't find um, a larger picture. The body would be put inside this bit here. And this is called a lahad. So it gives you like an L shape if you take it from here and then it goes in. So this is called a lahad. So Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was placed into the lahad. Why? Because it's a combination of both type of qabr. Number one, you have the normal one here. And the second one is there. So it covers Makkah and Medina Munawwara. That's why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Makki and Madani. It's simple as that. So the ikhtilaf amongst the Sahaba, it was baseless. They all agreed that if we use al lahad it will cover both the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Makkah and both the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina Munawwara. So Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was placed in there and the person who was responsible to dig the grave in Medina Munawwara, he was not there at the time of the wafat of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they called Sayyidina Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala an to dig the grave in the room of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha and the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, his head was directed towards the Qibla as we usually do. And this is where, inshallah, you will see later, the, the way his face was, 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 uh, was placed towards the Qibla, this is where usually the Imam would stand and lead the prayer in, in the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So after Sayyidina Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam, he was buried in there. Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she continued to stay in the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his existing qabr there. There was no barrier, there was no parda. On one side was the grave of Sayyidina Rasulullah salam, and on the other side was the room of Aisha Siddiqa, her bed that she would sleep on. Later on, her father, Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala an, two years later, he passed away. So permission was, was uh, sought by Aisha, and she said, yes, we can bury my father next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was buried in there. Ten years later came Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu after his khilafah, he passed away and he asked Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha permission to be buried next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha, she said, oh Umar, I had kept a place for myself next to my husband, Sayyidina Rasulullah, and next to my father, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. But because you are asking me, how can I say no to you? You know, this is a big decision to make, isn't it? Whether you want to be in the same room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, afdalul bashar ba'd al -anbiya. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she decided to give this place to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, because she saw something in Sayyidina Umar that could not match anybody else. So she gave this to Sayyidina uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. When Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he came and buried next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she put a barrier, a partition between the qabr and the place where she used to sleep. And there are riwayat to suggest that Qasim radiallahu ta'ala an, the nephew of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala an, huh, he used to come in to learn from Sayyidah Aisha. 
And every time he used to come, she would go to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and she would say, Oh Aisha, ikshifi li an qabrin nabiyy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remove for me from the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that I can see his grave. Now there are two things in here. Number one, there is a curtain, there is a barrier between the qabr and the room of Aisha. And some people would say that when he said, Ikshifi li, remove for me from the qabr of Rasulullah, some people have said that it refers to the curtain, remove the curtain so that I can see the qabr of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our ulama, they understood this hadith differently. When we uh, do tafsir or commentary of hadith, we take it word by word. The hadith says, Ikshifi li an qabrin nabi. From the qabr, the hadith does not say an hujratin nabi. If it was hujratun nabi, then it would mean the curtain. But he said an qabrin nabi from the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means that there was a chadar that was placed on the qabr of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qasim said, remove for me the, the chadar so that I can see the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which gives us an indication that Sahaba, they did put chadar on the qabr of Rasulullah and the sulaha and the awliya. Simple as that. So Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she put that partition because Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was there and he's a ghair mahram for Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then later on in the year 58 Hijrah, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she passed away just a couple of years before Karbala took place. Remember the incident of Karbala, Imam Hussein radiallahu an, she passed away a couple of years before that. Now Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she's been buried uh, in, in, in Baqi, not in the same room as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is uh, what you see here is a near example of the room of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will see the, the, the whole uh, section here is regard, regarded to be the room of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in this section here was only the house of Aisha. Allahu Akbar. You know, we want mansion, big houses, you know, and so forth. Look at a woman who's been guaranteed Jannah. Guaranteed Jannah. Look at the place where she's living. Just a bed in there and a few pots and, and, and pans and things like that. This was her house. You know why? Because she knew that she would get a house in Jannah that cannot be found anywhere else. She knew that this world, this dunya, this world here is just temporary. And the permanent world, the permanent dunya is in Jannah and she will get her house there. And here you will see in this section here, this is the qabr of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his uh, chehra mubarak, his face mubarak, is face towards this side because this is the qibla here. You stand here and you face the qibla. And this is the qabr of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this one here, the third one, is the qabr of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Uh, sorry, Sayyiduna Umar. There is an ikhtilaf also that the qabr is not placed in this manner here. There's one uh, narration that says that the qabr of Rasulullah is here. And then together here, level with the qabr of Rasulullah is Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And a little bit further down here, the head would start from here and is the qabr of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then the scholars comes in a hadith in Mishkat al-Masabih that in this section here, because now the house of Aisha is not there anymore, but in this section here would be the qabr of Sayyiduna. Sayyiduna? If you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. We're all learning. Aisha. Uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. His qabr would be uh, somewhere in this section here. Yeah? So Sayyiduna uh, Rasulullah, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, and here will be Sayyiduna Isa radiallahu ta'ala an. When he comes, he will go and perform the hajj, he will get married, he will have children, he will live for 40 years, and then he will make his way to Medina Munawwara. He will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take his life in Medina, and he will pass away in Medina, and he will be buried in the same room as Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. 
If you look of where the, how the place is now in Medina Munawwara, here, like we just explained, here is the Qabr of Sayyidina Rasulullah. Here is the Qabr of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and here Umar radiallahu an. And in this one here, which is a it, it's slightly bigger circle, this is where the Qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is uh, situated. But if you look in there, you will not see the Qabr. If anybody says to you that they see the Qabr of Rasulullah from here, he's lying. It's not. You won't see it. And here is Abu Bakr Siddiq. And here is Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an. And here in this section here, this is where Sayyiduna Isa radiallahu ta'ala anhu will be uh, buried. Now in this section here, um, or here, if you look on the top here, the green bit where Rasulullah is, his face is his face towards the Qibla, towards this side here. So this is where the Qibla is, and this is where usually the Imam, um, he would stand to lead the people in prayer. Now, the way the house of Sayyidina Rasul alayhi salatu was salam is, different people have come, you know, they have tried to build, you know, an, exam, an example of how his house and the masjid was. So in this uh, picture here, they have mentioned that this was the masjid. This was the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here they are the houses of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wives. And some people have also said that this is the house. One of them here was the house of Sayyida Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. So this is an example. We don't see it now. People have tried to explain it to us. We take it as it is. It is not certain, but this is just an example for us to have an idea of how the houses were so close to the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And here in between here, there was a door. And scholars have said that this section here was the house of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Aisha. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would just come out from his back garden here and he would enter the masjid and then he would go and lead the Sahaba in praise. Okay, so in the year 58 Hijrah, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she passed away. And all the houses remained as it was. Nobody touched them. Nobody probably went in there as a form of adab for the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They only used this section here. Okay, so from that time, 58 Hijrah, until the time of Karbala, when most of the Ahlul Bayt, had become shaheed on the plain of Karbala, the only person that remained was Zainul Abidin radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Okay? The grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zainul Abidin radiallahu ta'ala anhu, sometimes he would go in these houses and he would give dars. He would give lectures just to revive the moment that they spent with um, uh, the, the Sahaba that existed at the time just to revive that moment that they have with Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So he would go and spend time in these houses and give lectures and give dars, you know, teach hadith and so forth. And until then, until the year 91 Hijrah, it was considered that in Medina Munawwara, there was no more Sahabi left in Medina. Most of the Sahaba had already passed away. Now, who was the governor of Medina at the time? It was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was a descendant of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was very young at the time. Yes, he had some, you know, concerns for the deen. You know, he was an Islamic person. He used to pray and so forth. But he was more versed towards political stuff. He was a governor of Medina. But he used to pray, he used to perform his things and, and he used to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in his own ways. And the Khalifa at the time was the, the, the Umayyad Caliph, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. He was the Khalifa at the time, but he did not live in Medina. All, everything that he had to do or he had to say, he would write to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and ask him to do these things. Now in the 91 Hijrah, the houses of, uh, the houses of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wives, uh, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, he asked Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to buy all these houses, to buy all of them, because they had the intention of extending the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So something had to be done to find the space because a lot of people had started coming and living in Medina Munawwara. So they had to extend the masjid of Sayyiduna uh, Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Like I mentioned, there was no Sahaba living in Medina at the time. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz himself, he took part in flattening all the houses of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his wives just to extend the masjid. Now some tabi'i who lived in Medina at the time, the like of Abu Umama radiallahu ta'ala an, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab radiallahu ta'ala an, you know, great tabi'i who met a sahaba, they lived with sahaba, they learned with the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. They said that Abu Umama himself, he said, he said, I wish that they had abandoned this idea so that people would be discouraged from erecting buildings and see what Allah was pleased with his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam despite the treasures of the earth being placed in his hands. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he wanted mountain of gold, would be walking behind him. He would be the richest person on earth. Sayyiduna Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't wonder. Abu Umama, he said, people, I wish people could have come and see how the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived in this dunya. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, he himself, he said that I have seen the qabr of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, after Karbala, Yazid and his people, they came in Medina, they invaded Medina, they destroyed Medina, they killed a lot of people, a lot of Sahaba were killed. There were rivers of blood in Medina Munawwara. The people of Yazid, what they did, they took their horses, they left it inside the masjid of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was no azan and no salah for three days and three nights in the, in the masjid of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People were frightened. People were scared to go to the masjid. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, a great tabi'i, he said, and this is, this is well recorded in our books of history, and all the sects, all the groups, Islamic groups, they agree with Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab. He said that when Yazid and his people, they came in Medina, I could not go anywhere. The only place I could hide was in the ghurfa, in the hujra of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I just went there and I sat there. The people of Yazid, they could not get into the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can imagine why, because Allah is protecting this qabr. And who would go there? Umar was there. <laughs> yeah, when he was alive, people were scared of him. After his wafat, what would happen? People still be scared of him. You know, they wouldn't go in there. So Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, he went hiding in the ghurfa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Later on, his friends, they asked him, Oh Sa'id, you know, you hid in the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did you know it was time for Fajr, Asar, Dohar, Maghrib, Isha? How did you know it was Salah time? And he said, the only way I could find out the times for prayers was because I could hear the azan emitting from the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I know what time it was Fajr, I know what time it was Dhuhr, Asar, Maghrib, and Isha. He said, for three days and three nights, I heard azan from the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I prayed following the azan of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. Ya Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyab, he said clearly, and this is recorded in Wafa ul Wafa by Allama Samhudi rahmatullahi alayhi, inshallah, next week we will talk about him because most of these information are from his book, Wafa ul Wafa. So he, he mentioned this riwaya from Sa'id ibn Musayyab and he said, you know, a new generation from Medina and believers from around the world would gather, they would witness you know, the uh, austerity of the blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be discouraged from desiring and competing with each other over the, you know, the pleasures of this dunya. Just by seeing the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Imagine you go to Medina Munawwara and the original houses of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and his wives were there. You know, how would you feel? You know, just seeing all these things. Unfortunately, uh, it's been removed, it's been destroyed. The only thing that you have behind the house of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a small area and there are metal, a short metal barrier. This was considered to be the garden of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There was a date palm tree in there. Um, the date had shifa in them. You know, the hukumat 
they destroyed everything just to extend the masjid of Rasulullah uh, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Now, when in the time of uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, when they flattened all the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they started building, extending the masjid. One day, this person, Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Aqil ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he himself narrates this. And he says, that one night, I came to the masjid, possibly for tahajjud, between tahajjud and, and fajr salah. He went into, into the masjid, and whilst he got closer to the masjid, he smelled a fragrance that he's never smelled before. Never in his life. So he entered the masjid. As he entered the masjid, he saw that one of the walls of the room of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam had fallen. This section here. Okay, this section here had fallen down. And that's because the wall has become weak and stuff like that. So what, they, what he did, he understood the fragrance was coming from the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He explains everything. So what he did, one the riwayah actually says that he quickly went inside the room just to give salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another riwayah says that as he was stepping outside, he saw Umar ibn Abdul Aziz coming inside the masjid. So they were all shocked that this, uh, the western side of the wall had fallen down and people would start crowding and it will, you know, disturb the residents of this qabr. Sayyidina Rasulullah Bakr Siddiq and Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, out of adab and respect, he did not want a crowd around the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he quickly ordered, he's the governor, he quickly ordered the people to put a curtain around this section here just to cover it up for now. The same morning, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he gave the hukum to start digging the foundation to build the wall again. Now whilst they were digging, an incident happened. An incident happened. And a person called Urwa, Ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reported this himself. He said, whilst we were digging, the, the tool that we were using hit one of these residents' feet. We hit their feet. So we didn't know what it was, so we started digging slowly, 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 until we saw, you know, fresh, two feet in front of us. And we raised our hands and we started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa Allahu, Allahu Akbar. As salatu was salamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah. They started calling out Allah's name, takbir and risala for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they called Umar ibn Abdul Aziz very quickly. One riwayah said that people were frightened. They did not know what to do. So they called Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and he said, look, I, I don't know, I've never seen this before. This is a, a situation that I've never had to deal with before. So what we are going to do, let's call out the greatest scholar that we have in Medina. So he came and he was the great, great grandson of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. He was the scholar at the time. And look at the way these people, they would do things. If this had happened in our time, we would probably call the most influential person on earth to come and see this, isn't it? To make a decision on this. But in the time of these people, you know, they understood the importance of scholars. They are the only one who can only make this kind of decision. Not somebody who is non-Islamic and non-scholar. So they called the great-great-grandson of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abdullah, he came, he looked, he looked at where the wall had fallen and where they were digging and he said, no, this is not the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or Abu Bakr Siddiq. This is the feet of my great-grandfather Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is the feet of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. More importantly, what did they see? They saw blood coming out of the feet of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. They saw blood coming out of the feet of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, if 
after so many years, he passed away. We are talking about the 91 Hijrah here. So many years have passed. The feet is still fresh. The blood is still fresh. If this is the halat of Sayyidina Umar, imagine the halat of Rasulullah in his qabr. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are we going to question this? We can't. And more importantly, do you know who narrated this hadith? The person who narrated this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, narrated the hadith. Book 23, hadith 144. I can see that, you know, people are writing down things. But this is my reference according to the version that I use. But if you look at in Kitabul Janais, you will see the book of uh, Janazah. You will see the hadith in there reported by Sayyidina Urwa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he said that وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهَا قَدَبُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَمَا وَجَدُوا أَحَدًا يَعْلَمُ ذَلِكَ So we thought that this was the feet of Sayyidina Rasulullah صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم and none amongst us knew you know what to do at that time حَتَّى قَالَ لَهُمْ عُرْوَةً لَا وَاللَّهِ مَا هِيَ قَدَبُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَا هِيَ إِلَّا قَدَمُ عُمَرْ Until Urwa, according to the other narration, Urwa, he said, this is not the feet of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it is the feet of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he quickly uh, built the wall that had fallen down and to reinforce the walls around the qabr of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, what he did, he built a second structure around the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a second uh, structure was built around his room. What was used? He used the similar type of stones that the Kaaba is built, black stones. The same type has been used. He ordered them and it was used. And he built it in the shape of a pentagonal shape. And then there was a door, a small section that, uh, 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 in the structure that he built. He put a door in there so that people could get access to this. But the qabr of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he rebuilt it, that wall that has fallen, he had blocked everything and nobody would have access to the qabr in the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was no doors, there was no windows, nothing. And the second structure that he built uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he built it in this manner. So if you look on this picture here, the blue um, section here, this is the original house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyiduna Rasulullah here, Abu Bakr Siddiq here, and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhumah are here. Okay? And in, in probably this section here, we will be Sayyiduna Isa radiallahu anhu. And then here, you can see like the pentagonal shape. And in this section here, there's a small door that has been built by Sayyiduna Umar ibn Abdul Aziz so that people could have access just on this section here. But nobody would actually have access to the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he built this. When, after he built it, you know, we were talking about Chadar earlier, yeah? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he is a descendant of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu from his mother's side. Okay? His mother gifted a chadar to put around this section here, this structure here, just to preserve, you know, to make it look nice that there's a chadar written La ilaha illallah, a beautiful chadar. She gifted it to put on the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the second structure. Nowadays, the, stru the, the chadar is placed on the third structure, which we will talk about next week. But in that time, in his time, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the chadar was placed on this section here. And every 10 years, it is changed. In today's day and age, every 10 years, it is changed and the factory is in Medina. So what they do after every 10 years, when they remove the chadar, they actually cut it into pieces and they donate it to, you know, some chosen countries that they like to, or Allahu Alam, whether they sell it or not, Allahu Alam. But it is given to different, different people. So in this section here is the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And here Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he built a second structure made with similar stone that the Kaaba has been built. So here you could see uh, a near example 
of the wall that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So inside would be the qabr, the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here would be the structure that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz built. And the chadar was placed around this section here. So this is what Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he did to the qabr of Rasulullah uh, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. In after the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, nobody had access to the room of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nobody actually went in there. From the 91 Hijrah. Nobody had gone in there. Later on, in the year 654 Hijrah. Okay, in the year 654 Hijrah. There was a major fire in Medina Munawwara caused by oil lamps. It went onto the curtain and you can imagine at that time there was dry date palm tree so it will ignite the fire quicker and faster. Many portions, many sections of the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was destroyed. The wood that was placed on top to, uh, for the roof section, the columns and stuff, the pillars, all these were destroyed by this fire and people could not stop this fire and quite a lot of people also became shaheed in that fire so the year 654 hijrah so when this happened the roof had collapsed and fell into the qabr of sayyiduna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam now people at that time they did not have access to the qabr of sayyiduna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam so how could they go in there and people at that time, they would seek ijazah from the Khalifa of the time so that they could do anything before they would start any sort of construction, especially to the masjid of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So this person uh, called Al-Musta'sim Billah, he was in Baghdad at the time and he was fighting the, the Mongols. They were invading Iraq, killing a lot of people in Iraq. So he was preoccupied with this, him and his people. So they wrote to him and he wrote back to the people of Medina, to the governor of Medina and said, look, there's nothing I can do right now. Just clean the masjid, do whatever you have to do to the masjid so that people can pray in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When I come back from this battle, that's when I will look into the incident of this fire and construct the masjid of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So the scholars of Medina and many other places, the responsible people, they gathered in Medina Munawwara and they did whatever possible they could do just to uh, construct the masjid in their own manner so that people could come in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and pray in the blessed masjid of Sayyidina alayhi salatu wa sallam. So after all these years, more than 500 years, nobody had access to the qabr of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because it was locked up. Nobody could have access to it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq insha'Allah. Next week we will continue with those Sultan and Badshah who came afterwards. What they did, we will talk about the Jali Mubarak as well. You know, the golden uh, Jali that we see when we go to Medina. We will talk about that, who built it, how it was built. We will talk about the dome, the gumbad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from its original structure. And there was also a second fire in Medina. And we will talk about Allama Samhudi. Allama Samhudi, who narrated a beautiful story when he entered Medina to Munawwara. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq, insha'Allah, that we continue to learn the deen of Allah and the deen of his Rasul sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, we stand up for salatu salam. صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على سيدنا 
محمد اللهم صلي على سيدنا محمد مصطفى مصطفى منبع للصفا سيد الأنبياء مشعل في الوفا كان في عطفه لليتامى دفا مصطفى مصطفى منبع للصفا سيد الأنبياء مشعل في الوفا كان في عطفه لليتامى دفا هن قلبي له فض شوقا إلي ليس أرجو سوى شربة من يدي الصلاة عليه والسلام عليه مصطفى مصطفى منبع للصفا سيد الأنبياء مشعل في الوفا كان في عطفه لليتامى دفا الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى لك وأصحابك يا رحمة للعالمين الفاتحة اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وبحرمة أولاد النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم وبحرمة وجه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبحرمة يد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبحرمة شعر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبحرمة لسان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبحرمة لحي النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم وبحرمة قلب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبحرمة حرمة قبر النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم اللهم إنا نسألك زيارة مكة المكرمة اللهم ارزقنا زيارة مدينة الطيبة اللهم ارزقنا زيارة مسجد الأقصى يا رب العالمين اللهم يا منزل البركات نزل بركاتك علينا وعلى جميع المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات ونزل بركاتك في حياتنا وفي صلاتنا وفي عبادتنا يا رب العالمين اللهم يا منزل البركات نزل بركاتك في كل بلاد المسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم بارك علينا ببركة القرآن العظيم وببركة إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وبفضل سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين